Good morning. Good morning. Somebody didn't want to go bye bye. <laughs> I know how that feels. I woke up this morning and didn't want to go bye bye. <laughs> God, please, can we just have church in bed today? You can meet with me anywhere. Um, I have a number of thank yous I want to express today. Um, first, Josh and Nick and Thaddeus. Stick your hands up, guys. Put them up. Everybody needs to see you. Okay. Those are the guys that have been keeping the lawn mowed this summer. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They've been doing awesome job keeping the grass looking good and keeping the birds trimmed. Mary Lou! Mary Lou, yeah, you. Mary you, you. Mary Lou, you're not in trouble. Believe it or not. One of the few times from up here that I'm going to call you out. Mary Lou has done an incredible job with all the flowers out in the front, the flower pots, and the, the garden over here. It's been absolutely beautiful, so thank you very much. Tim Hunter! There he is! I don't know, a lot of you I know come in the back door, go out the front, look at our marquee. Yes. Tim has completely rebuilt it, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, thank you very much. He, he first looked at that and went, I don't think I can do this. And, but he undertook it, and it is amazing yeah. how, how incredibly good that looks. So thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> and for all of the, the people, I almost said men, but all of the people that came out yesterday to help split wood for the firewood pantry, um, boy, I was looking at the stack grow and grow and grow and grow and thinking, wow, whoa, whoa, man, we're doing awesome. I turn around and look what we still had to do. <laughs> That was a mistake. <laughs> we haven't even touched it. Where is all this wood coming from? Uh, but we had uh, three or four men out with chainsaws, cutting the wood to length. We had seven, eight, nine people splitting it and stacking it. Um, I'll tell you what, there's going to be a lot of need for firewood this year. If how much we got in is what God is telling us we need. And, and I have a permit right here for more because Matthew feels like we're going to need more. So um, keep that ministry in prayer. Thank you to everybody that showed up yesterday to help uh, cut, split, and stack. It was a, a tremendous blessing. So you can just clap for everybody. Um, I am a firm believer that Scripture tells us to be a people of thanksgiving. Okay? Not, not a people that consume turkey one day a year. Um, we, we are to live a life of Thanksgiving. That should be one of the earmarks. That should be one of the indications that a significant change has taken place in our life. We have Thanksgiving. We are just thankful for, one, everything that God is. Okay? All too often we get caught up in what God's done. But do you realize that who he is is sufficient for us to be thankful for? I mean, can you imagine a God that didn't love us? If God was not love, that would have never happened. <clears throat> if God did not have mercy and grace, overwhelming mercy and grace, that would not have happened. If God was not perfectly just, there would have been no need for that. I mean, you start thinking about who God is. And there is so much for us to be thankful for. And then, then we take the step to everything that he's done for us. You know that song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. Count Your Many Blessings, See What God Has Done. Do that, I challenge you. Start writing them down. Start making a list of everything that God has blessed you with, which is everything. Okay? Um, scripture tells us that you don't have anything but what God has given you, so don't act like he didn't give it to you. And then, I mean, the, the list is overwhelming. How could we not be thankful? Okay? So, when I get up, get up here and I'm saying thank you, uh, you know, it's not a matter of obligation. It's a sincere appreciation for the work that you guys do that makes Jesus Community Church work together to mesh, to be able to function in the way that we do. Okay, so be blessed because we have 
We're, we are not like most churches. You know, in most churches, they have the 80-20 rule, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and 80% of the people make the 20% regret doing so much work. <laughs> we are not like that. And it constantly amazes me, when we have projects that are going on, we have so many different people that step up to do things. Now, not everybody does everything. We shouldn't have to, because we have sufficient people to make sure everything is being done. Um, you know, I, I listen to my friends that are pastors. I talk with other pastors. I read things on the internet and in magazines. And I tell you what, I thank God every day for this church. <clears throat> because you guys make my job a joy. You guys make it so that I look forward to doing the things that are necessary for this church to fulfill the ministry that God has given me. You make my job easy. I mean, as often as not, by the time I know something is going on, somebody else has already stepped up to take care of it. And that just, that helps me to be able to focus on what I need to focus on. So thank you. Um, we're starting a new series today. And I don't know how long it's going to be. I don't, I, I, I give up trying to figure those things out. Okay. Um, but if you would, flip open with me to uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 5. start reading in verse 16 and we're going to read to the end of the chapter. So Galatians chapter 5 starting in verse 16. Paul says, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the de desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, envy drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, I read that whole passage, but that's not what our series is on. Psych. Yes. What, what, what I want to talk about is just one part of that passage. But in order to understand the part, we have to read it in context, okay? Because one of the things that God has been dealing with Christy and I on, and I'm not even going to teach on that because I don't feel like I understand it yet, okay? When I get to the point where I feel like I have a grasp of it, I'll share it with you, all right? But what God has been dealing with Christy and I is walk by the Spirit. And this is what I understand of walk by the Spirit. I don't understand it. Okay? Uh, I don't understand how exactly that's supposed to be played out in my life. I know one thing that God has revealed to me is that step by step, moment by moment. Okay? You don't get to the starting line and say, today I'm going to walk by the Spirit and <laughs> off you go. And all of a sudden, you're just walking in the Spirit. Maybe you can. It didn't work that way for me. It doesn't appear to be working that way for Christy. But I'll let you discuss that with her. Okay. <laughs> so, walk by the Spirit. In, in pondering this and in studying and trying to figure out how this is supposed to be played out in my life, I was coming across this passage, and, and it talks about the works of the flesh. Well, we're not going to talk about those either. If you don't understand what the works of the flesh by now... <clears throat> Nothing I'm going to say is going to help you, okay? Um, Paul goes on to say the works of the flesh are obvious, okay? Uh, can you tell when somebody's in their flesh? Yeah. yeah. 
drive a tractor in front of me on East Side Highway. I know, Dave, slow down. I'm slowing down. I have not passed a tractor in weeks. <laughs> Lots of prayer time. <laughs> God save this man, please. Okay. Yeah, I know, I'm still working on self-control. So, you, you, it's obvious, when somebody is in the flesh, when somebody is moving according to their own fleshly desires, according to the principles of this world, it's obvious. You know what they are, right? Okay? Um, we're not going to talk about that. Moving down. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and it lists the fruit. And he goes on to say, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we, des if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now what I want to talk about today is the contrast, okay? We have the works of the flesh, which are obvious, and we have the work of the Spirit. Now, do you see what it says? I, I actually mis misspoke there. It's not the work of the Spirit, it's the what? The fruit of the Spirit, okay? Now, one of the things that God has really been teaching me is I can't attain these of my own accord. I can't do anything to get the fruit of the Spirit. It's not like I, I can meditate long enough, work out hard enough, pray loud enough, read fast enough to be able to all of a sudden exhibit patience. Now, I've, I've shared with you my experience about praying for patience, right? <clears throat> Horrible. Do not pray for patience. Because you know how you get patience? You get put in situations that require patience. I, what I really should have prayed is, God, just take away anything that would require patience. <laughs> because he answered me in spades. It was the worst vacation ever. Ever. Anything that could go wrong went wrong. All right? And my mom and dad were very angry with me on that vacation. They asked me to pray before we left. And when I was done praying, they were both glaring at me. <laughs> they weren't even talking to me by the time we got home, which was a good thing. So, let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is this is fruit. Okay? So, if you are a Christian, you should in some measure have this. Right? Now, don't get me wrong. It's not a comparative thing. I'm not comparing me to you or you to you or you to whoever. As a matter of fact, a little bit later in the book of Galatians, Paul tells us, don't compare your, to each other. Don't, don't, don't do that. Compare yourself to yourself. Okay? That's, that's the only measure that you can go by. Because some of you will always exceed me at self-control. Christy has incredible self-control. She gets behind a tractor on Eastside Highway and she's not even aware she's behind a tractor. <laughs> and I sit in the seat fidgeting. Twitching. And after a while she's like, what is wrong with you? Nothing! If I take off my glasses, it really looks like we're going fast because I can't see much. <laughs> she wonders why I so often ride next to her without my glasses on. <laughs> Some of you are going to look at others and go, wow, I wish I had the love in my life that that person has. You know? Some of you, you're going to go, um, <laughs> peace, what's that? Peace, you know. Uh, the, the point is, when you've been saved, what is the assurance of your salvation? What is that? We are stamped with what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He is the seal put on our hearts. That's the assurance, the guarantee of our salvation. We are given God's Spirit. Okay? So, the fruit that he's listing here is not my fruit. It's not Glenn exhibiting love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It's God's Spirit in Glenn that births those things that come out of me. Okay? You understand the, the vine 
and the branches principle, right? We've talked about that before, that the vine is what gives the branch life, that if the branch is separate from the vine, it produces no fruit. It can't, because in and of itself, it doesn't have what is necessary to bear fruit, right? So if we're the branches and we have been plugged into the vine, we'll bear fruit. Peter goes on to say, in increasing measure, these things you will have, and in increasing measure, right? So, I should be able to look at my life today and compare it to where I was a year ago and have seen growth in some manner. I should be able to look at my life today and compare it to 10 years ago, and I should see a lot of growth. What I shouldn't do is look at my life and compare it to yours. Because sometimes I do that and I go, dang, Glenn, you stink. What a loser. And sometimes I look at it and I go, ha, ha, ha. I got this. Yeah, I'm not like that person. Yeah. Yeah. There's a proverb about pride going before the what. <laughs> Down I go. All right. And we're not supposed to be comparing it to each other. Okay. Why? There's one spirit, right? One spirit. And if that spirit is living in you, and that spirit is living in me, isn't it the spirit's choice to do as the spirit wills? Some of you are going to excel in peace because you need it. You need to exude peace for those of us that don't have it. There are a couple people that exude peace that I know, and I love to just sit by them. Just sit by them for a while. Because they have peace. And I can sit and I can kind of absorb some of that peace and just let it kind of ooze over me. There are some people that have self-control that I stand in sheer amazement at. I would have probably punched the dude in the mouth. No, thank God, not anymore. Not anymore. But boy, the self-control that some people exhibit is just astounding to me. Okay? My job is not to be like you. Your job is not to be like me. Our job is to be like Christ. Okay? The only way that we can ever be like Christ is to have His Spirit living in us and let Him change us. Okay? So, as we look at this list, we need to understand, first, let, let me clarify something. This is not an all-inclusive list. You, you understand that, right? This doesn't include everything that comes with having God's Spirit living in you. This is kind of like highlights, okay? High points of things that God's Spirit exhibits when He's in your life. But it's not all-inclusive because there are other things that God is going to do as well. Because, you know, well, how about mm, forgiveness? When God's Spirit is in you, that's the only way you can truly be able to forgive people. When you understand what God has forgiven you, how can you dare not forgive someone else? Okay? Think about that for a moment. All right? Because I know some of you have had grievous, grievous injuries given you. Okay? Some of them I can't even comprehend the depth of the pain you feel. Okay? And by justice's standards, you have every right to harbor anger and bitterness and rage. But first, that sin was not committed against you. First, that sin was committed against God. You understand that? Because before the action ever took place, that person had already sinned before God by conceiving it in their heart. You understand that? That sin was an offense before God first. Then it's an offense before God in a second measure because it was enacted on you. Do you see that? So if God is willing to lay down that offense, now let's take it even further into death. If God is so willing as to send his son to take upon all sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 
He became sin who knew no sin that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. If God was willing to do that to allow all sin to be poured out on his son that the full measure of wrath would be paid for, do we really think our offense is so great that we can hold on to it? Really? I think that just shows us how little we understand the measure God has forgiven us. Because keep in mind, um, we always want to quantify and classify sin. And we, we have the biggies. You know, and, and we all kind of have an idea what are the biggies. Like rooting for the Seahawks. <laughs> okay? I mean, really? No, but really, we have an idea. We all have this kind of ethereal idea as to what the biggies are. And then we have the ones that are, yeah, probably shouldn't do those. And then we have the ones that are kind of like, wink, wink, you know, the wink, wink sins. And, and sometimes they're radically different from you to me. The ones that I would put as a, probably better not to do that, you might think is a wink, wink. You might root for the Seahawks. <laughs> In which case, you need to talk to me after service. We will lay hands on you. <laughs> okay, really, I don't care who wins. I, really, I don't even know who won the Super Bowl. It was the Seahawks, right? They won last year? Right. Okay, yeah, because last year was a bad year. <laughs> um, but we have this idea of, of what sins should be classified as. But you understand that all sin is an affront to God. Right? You understand that... You may not have ever acted out your sin, but the fact that you conceived it in your heart is the same offense before God. He still feels that same offense. Okay? And if we can wrap our minds around the measure of forgiveness that he has poured out toward me, I can't imagine holding on to an offense. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can just go and all of a sudden you've forgiven everybody and there's no longer any offense. That, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying it's worked. But God is willing to do the work if you're willing to let him. Okay? God is willing to take away the pain if you are willing to let him. He is the divine healer. Okay? He wants you to be better. He doesn't want you to be bogged down with this. Okay? So, back to our list. The fruit of the Spirit. First, this is God's fruit in us, not my fruit. Okay? Um, you guys would be very disappointed in me if you saw the fruit that I have and could exhibit in my own life apart from God. That would be one of the branches you take and throw in the fire because it has nothing. All right? So, we're going to go through, and what I want to do this series on is we're going to look at each of these fruits that are represented here. And we're going to examine them and see what this is. Because keeping in mind, we're looking at it from the perspective of God's fruit, not mine. All right? So we're going to start with love. And today's going to be a little bit abbreviated for two reasons. One, because we have a lot of things that we need to discuss as far as ministries that are going on in the church that need to be dealt with today. Two, I just did a message on love not very long ago, and I went into a great bit of detail about the different types of love and how they're played out in Scripture and how they're evident in our lives or maybe not evident in our lives. So I, I want to deal with just a specific aspect of this today. All right? So, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, love... You know, in, in the Greek, there were four words for love that were used. In English, we have one. Okay? And in the Greek, they would use whichever one was appropriate to the sentence they were talking, so you didn't have to guess. All right? Um, eros, which is not in the Bible, but is a Greek word, was the, the physical attraction that one person has for another. That's where we get the word erotic. All right? 
then we have phileo, which is brotherly love, but really that's kind of not really what it means. The idea is more of a friend that you choose to love as a brother. Okay? And that's Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Well, that's, that's where we get that term. It's phileo. Okay? And this is a word that is used several times throughout Scripture. Uh, there's storge, which is how you love your family. You know? Um, because how you love your family is different than the friends that you choose to love as family. You're a whole lot more forgiving with your friends that you choose to love as family than you are with your family that is just your family. Right? Because your family does stupid things. <laughs> and sometimes they do them on purpose. Because they are family. And they can take that needle and just kind of give you a little poke. Alright? But storge is the way that you love your family. Alright? And then there is agape, or agapeo. All right? And that is unconditional, unqualified love. Now, we see this, these last three are used throughout the New Testament. Agape is the word being used here. The fruit of the Spirit is agape. Now, to kind of give you a working definition for agape, you know, because you look in a dictionary, it gives you a bunch of different, uh, to, to, to love one, to have affection for one, da 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 but, but we're going to talk about a scripture, so I'm going to come up with a better definition, because if you turn with me to 1 John, chapter 4, I want to take a look at how this is being described. We're actually going to read quite a bit more, so keep your hand right here in 1 John, chapter 4, but I'm... Um, we're going to read verse 7 and 8 for right now. John writing says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Okay? Now, the definition, the way, where I'm working from when we're talking about love right now, is love that is predicated on the idea of the giver, not the receiver. Okay? What, what I'm saying is, when I choose to love agape, I'm not basing it on their ability to satisfy any requirements. I'm choosing to love them because I choose to love them. Okay? Now, you look at that and you go, well, that could be storge. Well, yeah, it could be. But, but with storge, you know, uh, some of you have family members that you really don't love. Uh, in my, the Bible that I had growing up, I have quite a few passages that are marked with my brother's initials. <laughs> because God was teaching me to love my brother. And I didn't feel like I loved my brother. Okay? That's storge because you can, you can kind of fall out of that. Agape is not based on their ability to meet any requirement that you have. Agape is based on you willing to love them, being willing to love them, just choosing, I, I love you. I just love you. Okay, you just spit in my face, but you know what? I choose to love you. Okay, you just stole my favorite item and sold it for a fraction of the cost and bought something stupid with it. I choose to love you. Okay? So when we're talking about love today, this is the only definition we are working from. Agape, the love that God has for us, where he, by his nature, is love, and that love is being willing to choose to love us regardless of what we do or don't do. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody on the same page. When we're, from here on out, when we're talking about love, unless I say otherwise... That's what we're looking at. Okay? So. Back to 1 John. I'm going to read from here to the end. So keep up with me because we're going to go fast. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, no, let me qualify this, this love that he's talking about here, this is agape. The word being used here is agape or some form of agapeo. 
Okay? He's not talking about storge. He's not talking about phileo. He's talking about the unconditional love. All right? So you go, well, hey, man, I love everybody, even Seahawks fans. I love them. So you sit next to them and they start cheering when their team is winning and crushing yours. Okay? We're not talking about that kind of love. We're talking about agape. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. It, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfect, uh, perfected in us. <coughs> By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God. God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now there's a whole, on that right there is a week's worth of messages right here. Okay? There's, there's just a lot packed into that few verses of scripture. There's a couple things I want to point out to you. All right? First, this is the demonstration of God's love for us. He sent his son into the world so that we could live. Right? Right? Yes. That, that's his demonstrating love. He sent his son. Okay? John 3.16. Somebody quote John 3.16 for me. Okay, we got an NIV, an NASB, and a King James. <laughs> All going at the same time. Alright? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that to whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, that right there, that verse, we just got all of that right here. Okay, why did God send his son? Yeah, well, he, he loved the world, so he sent his son so that we could have everlasting life. Right? Okay, that's agape. If God were not agape, if God were just phileo, could you imagine the trouble we'd be in? <laughs> you ever had a best friend or a close friend that did something and became not your best friend? And oftentimes when that happens, they become your worst enemy? Uh, all right. We'll have to edit this out because I don't want my sister to see it. <laughs> my sister had this all the time. Oh, Debbie's my best friend. Half an hour later, I hate her. I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. <laughs> okay, Connie. Connie is my new best friend. Connie. Connie doesn't treat me like, guess what Connie just did? <laughs> That's okay, there's 74 other girls in the school. You can pick one of them. Man, you'll make it all the way to Saturday. And she would have a best friend and then lose a best friend and have a best friend and lose a best friend. And, and it was doom, 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 doom. Okay? I can count three best friends that I've had in my life. Two of them ceased to become best friends when they moved away and we just, we just lost connection. If I could find them again and reconnect with them, we would still be friends. Well, they might not like me. I don't know. The third one I married. And she will always be my best friend. Okay? So, I don't understand, you know, people that today they're my best friend and tomorrow there's another best friend and, and then the, the best friend of yesterday is not my best friend anymore because 
they ate a cookie I wanted, or they spoke to a boy that I wanted, or they, I, I don't know, I don't get it. Okay, I, I, I don't get it, okay? If God had that kind of love for us, how much trouble would we be in? Lots. Do you think that would have motivated him to send his son to the cross for us? Oh, no. Oh, no. No. Okay? Think if it was Storge. And it was, you know, the family love, the kind of obligatory love because you share genetics or parents or bedrooms. Did any of you guys have to share bedrooms with your siblings growing up? Yeah. yeah. At one point I had to share a bedroom with all three of my brothers. Someday I'll make a message out of that. <laughs> we'll have to edit that one too. Because <laughs> some of you got to meet my oldest brother. You, you got to see the character that he is. Okay, I had to share a room with that. <laughs> he had to share a room with this. <laughs> if, if God had that kind of love for us, would he have sent his son? No. No. The love that he has for us is based on his character, his nature, his choice. Not us. Okay? So, first thing we're pointing out is it was because of this kind of love that God sent his son. Um, verse 13. But this we know that we abide in him. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Boy, did anybody, how many of the men were here that got to watch that Louis Giglio video, Tupperware? Okay, that was, that was probably one of the best demonstrations of this passage I've ever seen. We actually have it on order. It will be in the church library. I'm supposed to get it the first part of next week. So when you get a chance, check out Grace by Louis Giglio. Um, incredible demonstration. Um, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Okay, see how this is starting to tie together? The fruit of the Spirit is love. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us. He has given of us, given us of His Spirit. Alright, you see the connection there? Love, Spirit, Spirit, love. See how that works? I'm, I'm assuming that you're excited because that was a well-made point. Okay. Okay. Moving on. Uh, verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. See, this is one of those things that we really need to understand, that we need to grasp, and I confess I struggle with. Okay? Because of his great love, we are not... What? Because of his great love, we are not... Condemned. Consumed. Okay? Now, here's the thing. We just quoted John 3.16. What does verse 17 say? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Okay? Now, there is a day when we will stand before the throne of judgment. Okay? Now, there are two possible outcomes from that. Only two. One is for the master to say, well done, enter into my rest. And the other is to be cast into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth to the eternal lake of fire. Okay? That's the only two options. Now, there is only one way to make the first option possible. Okay? You understand that. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. That is confessing him as Lord. Right? That is allowing him to live in us, for him to abide in us, and abiding in him. Now, the point I want to make is this. All right? By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. All right? If you don't know how the judge is going to find, and you walk in, and your life is on the line, and the judge says, 
whatever I say goes. And you're not sure that he's going to say guilty or innocent. You're walking in like this. Amen? Because mm -hmm. you're walking in in what? You're walking in in fear. Mm -hmm. You're walking in in fear because this man has a power of life and death over you in his hand. Okay? But if you know, if the judge has already told you, I'm going to declare you free, how do you walk in? You walk in, oh no, you. We are the champions, my friend. Yeah. Sub judge. Okay? You walking in with confidence. Are you walking in with fear or are you walking in with confidence? confidence. See, that's what this verse is talking about. How are you coming before the throne of judgment? Are you coming in with confidence because he has found you innocent? Not because what you did was right, but because you believed, because you accepted, because you abide in him and he abides in you? Or are you walking in not sure? Because if it, you're walking in not sure, guess what the verdict is? Guilty. Depart from me. For I never knew you. See? Read this again with me. Keep that in mind. Verse 17. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Okay? Do you see the second part of that? What, what catches the second part of that? We're supposed to live this way in this life. Not just in the future. Not just in eternity. We're supposed to live this now. We got to agape it. We got to agape it now. We can't just sit around waiting for it to move on us. How do we agape it? We don't. God's Spirit does. We choose to walk by His Spirit, not by, His, by our flesh. Right? We choose to not call down curses on the driver of the tractor in front of us. We choose when a situation arises to do that which we know God is birthing in us. Because I tell you what, if God wasn't birthing it in you, you wouldn't ever consider not doing it. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. See, we're still, still talking about the same thing. If you're walking in before the judgment seat of Christ, fearing punishment, you have not experienced love. You have not been made perfect in love. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about being made perfect, you know, like you're never going to sin, you're never going to stumble. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone says that he is without sin, you're a liar. Go back to the first chapter of 1 John. Okay? But thank God we don't live there. We live in 2 Corinthians 5. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay? So, no fear. I always laugh when I see those shirts. No fear. You guys have no clue what you're talking about. But I do. Okay? So, I mean, you think no fear of getting on a bike and driving down a mountainside? Anybody can do that for the first five feet. Okay? Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And then it wraps up, and this, this, is, this is hard, guys. This is hard. But if we say that we love God and yet hate our brother, we lie. Okay? John is, is, there's no guessing what John means here. Okay, we can't dance around the bush on this one. If you are professing that you love God, that you are a Christian, okay, because by definition you are a little Christ, which means you are modeling Christ to this world. If you are professing to be a Christian and hating your brother, That goes back to the whole forgiveness thing that we just talked about a little while ago. Okay? 
Because how can you say that you love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you have seen? If you can't love your brother whom you've seen, you can't love God whom you haven't seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now I'm not talking, uh, Paul, I'm sorry, John is not talking right here about a biological brother. Because some of you are like, I'm off the hook, all I got is sisters. Uh, no, 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 no. He's talking about the brotherhood of mankind. Even your enemies. You know. Remember what Jesus said? Love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. Remember that part? Yikes. Ouch. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He did say it would be worth it. Okay. All right. I'm going to wrap up with this. 1 Corinthians 13. You should have expected this to come, right? What does this love look like? 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read the chapter. And I want you guys to really look at this because this is the love that God has. And the love that He is requiring of us. The love that His Spirit gives us and the fruit that we bear should reflect this. All right? So he starts off, he's talking about the gifts that he just wrapped up verse 12, or chapter 12 talking about. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Have you ever known people like that? And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you love us just like this. That, Father, you're not irritable, that you're not keeping record of wrongs, that you're enduring, that you're bearing, that you're forgiving. I thank you, Father, that this is the love you have for us. But Father, I ask, as you have called us to this same kind of love, Father, that your spirit would birth it in us, that it would grow it in us, that Father, our life would be abundant with the fruit of love. Father, not not as the world understands it. Not as Dr. Spock would have us believe. But Father, as is your very nature that we would love. Help us, Father, to abide in you as you abide in us. Teach us day by day, Father, how we should love. I thank you for this, Father. I thank you that you have not asked of us anything but what you have already given us. 
And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Uh, we